Welcome to the Shamrock Green Room, your favorite podcast highlighting everything about SCOTA Central Catholic and Columbus Catholic Schools. Each episode, we discuss what it's like to be a Shamrock and tell stories from people who have lived their life as Shamrocks. Whether that's a current student, a teacher, an alum or supporter, we want to hear your stories on why this is such a special place in education. I'm Taylor Dahl, Communications Director for Columbus Catholic Schools, and today I'm joined on our very first episode with Jeff Onuka, the Executive Director of Columbus Catholic Schools. Jeff, thanks for taking time out of your busy summer schedule to embark on this journey with us. Oh, I think this is awesome. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, it's going to be really fun. So let's start with your current role. What responsibilities do you have as the Executive Director at CCS? Yeah, so as Executive Director, my job is, it's, it's very similar to the, to the previous job that I had as President of SCOTUS Central Catholic. So my job is to uh, provide support to the principals that are in our elementary schools and to provide support to Mr. Van Cura, our principal at SCOTUS. Uh, my job is also to create budgets, to strategic plan for the Columbus Catholic School System, and really to kind of help develop the mission and the vision for our system. Uh, I work with our board of directors uh, to do that. We've got an awesome board of directors that, that help me every step of the way on that. So uh, it's kind of an all-encompassing type position, um, not maybe as specific as the previous position I had as president and principal of SCOTUS, but it's just really great to be in the elementary schools. Uh, I try to get out there every week to be in the schools and just to see all the great things that are happening there. And, of course, the great things that are happening at SCOTUS. It's kind of nice. You kind of get that variety and you get to kind of feel that, you know, you could walk into an American government class at SCOTUS, but then a couple hours later, go walk in into a kindergarten class and just be able to see the levels of learning has got to be pretty cool. I love the interaction with the kids. I wish I had more time to do some of those things about being in the classroom, but the principals do a great job of, of that. I love to interact with the teachers. You see a lot of different things when you're going from a, a kindergarten classroom, like you said, uh, the level of engagement and and the organization that it takes to be a kindergarten teacher all the way up through a, a senior high school level teacher. But the, the beauty of it is, is just to see the good people that we have doing the work that they do. Um, I see and notice many things that they probably never even think that people see. And that makes that helps make this a really special place. So kind of to add on that, with this being our first episode, can you give listeners an introduction a little bit to why this is such a great school system for students and families? Since 1884, Catholic schools have been a part of the Columbus community. We are so blessed to have three elementary schools, three Catholic elementary schools, SCOTUS Central Catholic. You know, we have 880 students that are going to Catholic schools here in Columbus. It's an extremely unique situation when you look at the, just in the state of Nebraska, there's really no one else that rivals what we do here. So it's a really special thing. But it's a better way to organize all of that. It's a better way to bring everybody together. You know, like this year, for example, at the end of the 23-24 school year, the sixth graders, every sixth grader is moving on to SCOTUS. That's in our elementary schools, every one of them. So we're really all, everybody's on a path trajecting toward uh, SCOTUS Central Catholic. So it-- it's really important for like our K, th- K through 6 system have everybody doing the same thing, you know, curriculum wise, uh, make, you know, trying to provide similar programs, similar experiences. We want those schools to still have their own separate identities, but the similar experiences allow our kids to be on an equal playing field when they, when they get to SCOTUS at, at grade seven, uh, because like I said, you know, most of them are coming here. So it's really a way to make sure that that happens. It's also, and I think this is one of the most important things is, giving teachers the opportunity to collaborate with each other. As part of a system, it's really important that third grade teachers, let's say the third grade teachers at Isidore's, Anthony's, and and Bonaventure are working together on things. They're teaching similar curriculum. They have similar experiences as opposed to maybe the kindergarten teacher. I'm not saying that teachers within their own school won't learn from each other and collaborate with each other as they do school improvement, but it's really important, in addition to it's really important, that they are collaborating with their peers who are doing the same things that they're doing. Well, you kind of get that little extra family. Like you have your Anthony's family, but being, like you said, a third grade teacher at Anthony's, well, maybe I want to talk to the other third grade teacher at Bonds, and you kind of get that extra support, which is really nice. Right, and, and, you know, you don't want the elementary schools to operate really as three separate islands. We want them to, to be a shared experience. The principals that we have in those buildings work so well together 
with each other. They plan many things together with each other. They're in support of each They provide so much support to each other as well, too. Uh, and we just want our our families, the Columbus Catholic School families, to understand that, you know, no matter where you're at, you're going to get a great education wherever you choose to send your child because you chose it because it just works better for you, that that location or whatever works best for you. But uh, it's just a, a unified approach to this, to everybody working toward knowing and loving and serving God and, and the mission of our Catholic schools as an evangelization tool of our church is of the utmost importance. Let's dive into your history. Where did you grow up and go to school and kind of talk about your childhood a little bit? Yeah, so I grew up, first of all, uh, in a very, very small town, the town of Tui, which is over by Valparaiso. Um, if you've heard of Tuffy's Bar over in Tui, to, uh, Tuffy's Bar, Tuffy was my grandpa's brother. Uh, some people have heard of that before. So I went to a one-room schoolhouse, and, you know, I'm not that old. I'm only, you know, 55 years old, but I went to a one-room schoolhouse. Uh, it was a K-8 through building. I went there until I was uh, through fourth grade, and then we moved to Wahoo after that. But uh, what a great experience I had being in that one-room schoolhouse. I learned to have a great love of reading at my one-room schoolhouse because – the teacher would work with me for 10 minutes or so and then move on to somebody else. And I'm kind of a guy, I probably got my stuff done a little too fast sometimes. <laughs> but I but I would go and then uh, start to read a Hardy Boys book or, you know, something like that. Um, I really loved to read because of that because I had that, that time on my hands. But I didn't know any different, didn't know that I was going to such a sure. small school or whatever. That, that was just my world then. Uh, then I uh, went to St. Wenceslas Elementary School in Wahoo extremely blessed to be a part of that school. That was a time where my parents had gotten divorced when I was going into the fifth grade. And uh, me personally, like I, I needed that school. I, the sisters that were working in that school, they were great. I mean, they, they helped take care of me. They helped me grow up. They provided support to me. And I'm forever just, uh, just uh, in gratitude and, and blessed to have been a part of St. Wenceslas Elementary School. Eventually, I graduated from Wahoo High School in 1987. You know, basketball always meant uh, the basketball and baseball, I suppose, probably meant the world to me when I was growing up. And uh, we had a great run there uh, when I was playing. But uh, Wahoo was just a really a special place to grow up as well, too. It was a town of uh, 3,000 people. We could ride our bikes everywhere. You know, you go play baseball in the morning. You go to the pool in the afternoon. You know, my mom was a single mom working. You know, we were probably unsupervised some of the time, but, you know, there was just, uh, you didn't have to worry about things. Sure. You know, you didn't have to worry about where you were going, what you were doing, because you were safe. You were in a, you were in a, a safe location. And uh, right across the street from our house was what was called the Wahoo Civic Center, which is kind of like a YMCA and where I spent all of my time uh, shooting, shooting hoops over there. Uh, doing that. Uh, eventually got a job there while I was in high school, and so I spent uh, many, many hours uh, there. But uh, yeah, great times. I have great memories of Wahoo. My mom still lives there, and uh, so go back there often. Sure. So how early did you feel the impact of Catholic education, would you say? Yeah, I'd say immediately. Just as, just as soon as I went to St. Wenceslaus in Wahoo, I started to feel the impact of uh, a Catholic education. Going to Mass every day. You went over, you served all of the funerals. You helped the bishop when he came. Uh, you would help, you know, serve those masses. There was probably like four or five sisters. There was a convent across the street from the school. We had, we had two, we had the Marian sisters and the Notre Dame sisters in Wahoo. We had so many sisters that were teaching within the building. Like my love of Catholic education was probably fostered by uh, Sister Carol Kelly, who was a Marian sister. She was a longtime administrator within the Lincoln Diocese Elementary Schools. So just loved her. She just brought structure to my life and and really instilled a, a love of God uh, for me. It was really instilled in me at a, at a young age uh, how important Catholic education was. That's great. You went to UNL, right? I did after, go to UNL. After Wahoo? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so— when you got to UNL, did you know you wanted to be a teacher? And what teachers and coaches made a pretty big impact on you growing up in Wahoo? This question you ask is a big part of my life because uh, I knew that I wanted to be a uh, teacher and a coach back in junior high. I knew that that's what I wanted to do. 
I had great role models, uh, Paul Johnson in, in Wahoo. Uh, eventually ended up playing for Mick Anderson uh, at Wahoo. Uh, Paul Eady, who was our assistant basketball coach at that time, eventually became the AD at Wahoo. Huge impact in my life. Those guys provided me such a, a influence in my life, just a, a, a way to live my life. That I knew that that's, that's what I wanted to do. I, you know, I love competition. I love the the idea of competition and and how you know you you have to be driven to succeed. Being a social studies teacher and being a basketball coach, it was just like locked in my brain all the way back when I was probably in sixth grade. I think I was in like sixth or se- sixth or seventh grade, and I have a sister that's uh, maybe I was eighth grade, but my sister is about four years younger than I am. I was coaching her little girls basketball team at like when she was in fourth grade (laughs) I was doing that already so I just knew that that's that's what I wanted to do I loved it the beautiful thing that I had happen to me was when I was a freshman in college at UNL I got asked if I wanted to come over to Pius to help be an assistant basketball coach to be a volunteer to start off with with the freshman team that changed my life ultimately changed my life the people that I was connected with still impact my life today. So there was actually a guy from Newman who knew some guys at Pius and said, Hey, there's, he told him about me and said, Hey, this guy's going to wants to be a coach someday and he's going to be a good coach. And, and if there's a chance for him to get some experience over there, that'd be great. It happened to be that Bridget McPhillips. Okay. Okay. Who, who works for us here at SCOTUS, her dad, Jim Hansen was the baseball coach at Pius. So immediately I started helping him coach baseball at Pius. And then I worked with, and the basketball, it was crazy. So I came in and Pius was in their, it was the start of the heyday for Pius and the rivalry between Pius and Wahoo High, actually. Um, and, and so some people have seen the Richter roar, that the, 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 what happened at Bob Devaney Sports yeah. Center. And I was on the bench for that game when we led by six points. Uh, when I say we, Pius, we led by six points with about 14 seconds left, and and Wahoo hit two three pointers in a row to tie the game, and send it to overtime. And they beat us. I worked with Tom Seib, who was an outstanding basketball coach and a great mentor and friend to me. He was just a super basketball coach, and I'm just so grateful that eventually he won a state championship a few years later after the heartbreak that he had to endure. Uh, Ray Fericki, who went on to become the the basketball coach when. When Tom Seib retired, Russ Ewing, who was the freshman coach at Pius at that time, uh, he eventually will go on to become the uh, head basketball coach over at Lincoln High. But here I was, I was working under him as an assistant coach. And then uh, Don Kelly, who was uh, just the like the ultimate girls basketball coach, Class B at Pius. He was a, just an outstanding basketball coach. So I'm like around all of these guys. George O'Boyle, longtime track and cross country coach at Pius. Tim Aylward, long longtime football coach at Pius. I mean, how could I not learn how to be a man, how to set a good example, and how to develop a a, a winning program by not being I mean, those guys that they changed the trajectory of my life because they just brought so much knowledge to me and so much help to me that I never would have been able to do the things that I've been lucky enough to do in my life without those guys. There's just impossible to think. So I'm just forever grateful. Uh, another guy that helped out at, at Pius during that time, Steve Bartek. Steve was oh, actually yeah. from Wahoo. He went on and uh, he left Wahoo or left uh, Pius, got the head basketball coaching job over at Malcolm. So he was the head basketball coach there. Eventually, he went to Lincoln Northeast to be the girls' basketball coach. Had great success at Lincoln Northeast as a girls' basketball coach. I see he's even on the assistant for, like, Lincoln North Star now uh, for girls' basketball. What great experiences I had at at Pius uh, that just helped form me. So that, you know, that kept me on track for at UNL. Uh, It all made sense. I was working for Pius, coaching for Pius taking my classes. I eventually did my student teaching at Pius. And so just, uh, it was just a good thing. Did you think at the time that Pius was where you wanted to end up? Or um, were you kind of open to, I mean, obviously you're 22 years old. You're kind of open to whatever, wherever the job takes you, but being around all those positive influences, I mean, that's a who's who of people. Like it'd be pretty hard to be like, ah, I don't, I, I could stay here. 
Oh, definitely uh, could have been a, uh, it would have been a privilege to have been a part of Pius for yeah. sure. You know, if it, life changes a little bit, you, you know, I, I'm eventually going to get married right as I'm ending uh, college. So that kind of changed things. But it would have been a pro just to I mean, circle back to that definitely would have been a privilege to have been a part of Pius. So sure. So you mentioned getting married. So you met Deb at UNL. Can you kind of walk us through that courtship a little bit? Yeah. So she was uh, she graduated a year before I did. And we met really late in our time at UNL, and uh, we dated for about a year, and, and I proposed to her. She was going to be starting to apply for her job. She, was a, she started off as a family consumer science teacher, first of all. And I remember one time she went out and she interviewed out in Benkelman. And oh, I was yeah. Just, and I was just like, okay. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> it kind of a long ways away, and I proposed to her, and uh, we decided to get married. And we got married in August of, actually got married in, in August of 1991. So uh, I was doing student teaching at Pius. We lived on a little house on N Street in near 48th and O. It was great. Uh, we had our first daughter, Katie, came along. And on the day that I graduated on this, in December, I went and picked up my diploma from UNL with my four-month-old daughter in my hands, uh, who's now teaches over at at St. Bonaventure Elementary School, but uh, I'll always remember that, Carrie and Katie, over to uh, as I picked up my diploma. And then Ryan came along pretty soon after that, and so we had two kids. Uh, life comes at you fast. Yeah. You know, I'm like 23, 24, whatever it is, years old, and uh, got two kids. And a few years back from that, I'm single, and, you know, you just go wherever you want, you do whatever you want, and then you get married, and you got kids, and, you know, all your priorities change. For sure. Your priorities change that you you got to take care of the people that you love. Yep. And so uh, you have to try to find the best job that you can, but also and do things that can provide for them as well too. So, so where did that first job take you? Yeah, so we went to I went to a teacher fair at UNL, and there was a little town there called well, it was the high school was called Hillcrest High School in Cuba, Kansas, and I'd never heard of Cuba, Kansas, and I'd never heard of Hillcrest High School, but they had a social studies job and a head boys basketball. And a family and consumer science position, which is what my wife taught. We talk about it. We go down there. We take a look. It's a town of about 250 people. You talk about, again, things that change your life. We spent four years at Hillcrest High School in Cuba, and it was awesome. It was awesome. I was the social studies department. (laughs) Uh, I was the only one teaching social studies I was blessed when I got there. We had really good basketball teams, and uh, we had a lot of talent. Uh, The first year we made it to the district final, and uh, we lost to uh, kind of a powerhouse over there called Baileyville. Lost to them by, I don't know, it was about six or eight points or so. The next year we made state. You talk about the things that you'll always remember that that school had never made it to state, and I just remember how special that was. And I had one of the guys, who, the guy who drove the bus for us, a man by the name of Tom Lashovsky. Uh, he had a twin boys who played for me, Nate and Bran, who are still in contact with today, even after all these years. I just remember, like, the tears of joy. Like, I'm walking out to the bus after it's over, and, and he grabs me and hugs me, and just the tears of joy on his face. Uh, it's like, you know, we've never been here before. We're, ne- we're never doing that. And I was just like, yeah, I mean, either. And, <laughs> and, and so, I mean, it was just, uh, it was just a special, special thing. I remember getting back to the town and, and it was late and it was like 10 30, 11 o'clock or by the time we got back and, and people were like, well, where are we going to celebrate? And they opened up the grocery store in town and everybody sat on, sat on milk crates uh-huh. in the grocery store and just sat there and, and just talked about what a great night it was and how special it was. And our time in Hillcrest was was just a really, really good good time. So, so was that like a like a class D1, D2 kind of school, like 20 kids per grade? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say? I'd, I would say for sure uh, it, it, was, it was D1 – but probably more toward more leaning toward D two. Okay. We actually played some Nebraska schools. We played uh, at that time. It was Chester Hubble Byron. Oh yeah, right uh, we, on the border. We, yeah, we played them, and we played Nelson, which is now part of Lawrence Nelson uh, mm-hmm. School District. And then I think is Chester Hubble Byron is part of like Thayer Central now. Sounds right. Down there uh, on Highway eighty one, right before. So, but the thing about like Cuba is it's just across the border. Yeah. Uh, it's not that far. I mean, it's. If you go down Highway 81 uh, and you go through Chester, Nebraska, and the next town you hit is Belleville, Kansas, if you go seven miles 
east of Belleville, Kansas, you're in Cuba. Okay. And so it, it's not a school anymore. It got mm-hmm. absorbed by uh, Belleville. Rep- the, it's called Republic County, Kansas, or Republic County High School now. Um, but the gym still sits there, and the banners that we the banners that we created uh, during that time uh, were pretty cool. And they're still up in the in that school, I guess. They're still sitting there. So that's cool. Yeah, I know Kansas is a little bit different than Nebraska when it comes to, like state <clears throat> tournament. So where'd you play the state tournament? So we went to Fort Hay State, and okay. so there were six classes. I think there were six classes in Kansas, and yeah. every class had a different location, different sites, which you know is kind of unfortunate. Actually, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we loaded up our two vans and drove. We didn't even take a bus. We drove our because we had such a small team. You know, I I probably only had a. a you know, there's probably only about 14 kids in the whole program. You know, my assistant and I, uh, we drove down to Fort Hayes State. We lost to uh, a school, Madison, in the in the first round at state. Uh, we did set a record that day. One guy, uh, he got called for sh- in the act of shooting on a three pointer four times because he baited us. That today there would be rules against that. He yeah. shot 24 free throws that day wow. against us, and they beat us by like six. So. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. yeah, you're not gonna forget that one. Nope, I could probably I could even tell you his name. But yeah. <laughs> uh, so, what's me- one memory you have from the classroom, and then one memory from the basketball court from your time in Cuba? Yeah, so uh, you know the classroom, um, you just have a lot a lot of different things that you that you think about, like in the classroom. But but mainly it's it's when you can tell that you're having an impact on kids. Like when you see them working collaboratively together, you've created an assignment and it works, and then you see it work for the kids. In in the whatever twenty years or so that I was in a social studies classroom, you know that's what I remember most about when they got excited to do that. I think about uh, sometimes you do activities or simulations or things like that, especially in social science. It's kind of easy to do those types of things and. It's really exciting to see the kids get really interested in it and they're engaged in it. The coaching part, you know, for me, my favorite thing about coaching is when the game is over and you win and you go back to the locker room. I I would say there's probably two things. One, I would love, and this kind of rang true, I I, I can remember that feeling when I was coaching at SCOTUS that, like, you force the other team to call a timeout and your bench gets excited and they all run, would run past me to go meet the guys that were out on the floor. I love that mm-hmm. because it's just like everybody's just all in. But we always had a tradition from the time I was uh, down at Cuba Hillcrest all the way through coaching at SCOTUS is, you know, as soon as we got, we didn't, you know, the kids and the co- assistant coaches waited until I got back in the locker room and then we clapped it up. And then, you know, we, we got excited about we celebrated every win. It's easy. sometimes you know you have success, and you can take winning for granted, and you cannot ever take winning for granted. Nope. You have to celebrate winning, and I just remember the the clapping it up and excited about it, and you know the enthusiasm and how just the adrenaline that would flow through me after we got back to that locker room, and then being able to go around and, and with each kid shake their hand, high five or whatever. And just tell them, man, you know, I loved what you did out there today. You were yeah. awesome. Uh, you know, those are those are that that I'll always remember that about coaching. So after a few years in Kansas, a new opportunity opens up at Cedar Catholic in Hardington. What excited you about that opportunity, or what made you kind of probably just looking for something different, or what, what what led you up there? Yeah, so I think the idea of getting back into Nebraska basketball was a thing, but Hardington Cedar Catholic. I, I wanted to be in a Catholic school. Yeah. And Harrington Senior Catholic was, like, yeah. they, were, they were good at basketball. Mm-hmm. You know, they maybe hadn't won, you know, like state championships or anything like that, but they were perennial power. Yeah, 21 in, team every yeah, year. Yeah, in basketball. And so, you know, I can remember going up there, looking at it, and even the pay didn't phase me, <laughs> mm-hmm. and the gym didn't phase me. Yeah. We had the small, I think we had the smallest gym in the state. I mean, I can't imagine that Holy Trinity gym up in Hardington, you talk about a home court advantage that we'd have. And there were – we, you know, we played lots of great teams in that gym up there, whether it was Laurel, whether it was West Point CC, Boone Cent, Albion. They were Albion at that time, was outstanding. Norfolk Catholic had great athletes. Pierce had Matt Herrian and some of those guys. I mean, it was, it was tough. Yeah. Tough. 
but we were pretty good, you know, and the state champ always came from northeast Nebraska. When we were in C2, the state champ every year would come from uh, our area, whether it be Ponca or Laurel or Randolph, you know, and they were always in our subdistrict. Mm-hmm. You know, I can remember a subdistrict at Crofton we played, and Ponca and Laurel and us of the four teams. Uh, the fourth place team, the fourth seeded team was Hardington High, and they had about 15 or 16 wins. Yeah. And uh, so I think you had number one and number two and number four team in the state in the same subdistrict, and there was no wild card. Yeah. In the seven years that I was at Cedar, there was not a wild card. Mm-hmm. And we had a tough, tough memory at Cedar. You know, oh, we, sure. There was a year where we were a fantastic basketball team. Joe Schoenfelder, who's our maintenance uh, director here at SCOTUS, played for me up there, and we went through the whole season undefeated. Played a lot of great teams. You know, we, I think we were 22-0. and 0. We were playing Laurel for the third time. Laurel had an outstanding basketball team. Uh, we were playing at, at Norfolk High in the district final, and we got tense, you know, mm-hmm. in the second half. You know, we had some close games, but we didn't have a ton of close games during that season. And uh, we lost, ended up losing that game by five points. Yeah, wow, the nightmares come after that. Oh, yeah. You know, the – the feeling of dread you go in the locker room with the kids that you've spent your your whole season with just kicking but you know we we were we were so good mid-state conference champs and and regular season and tournament champs and all those things and then boom it's over yep in 16 minutes in the second half it, it all disappeared and you know i i don't think there's any question about it there would have been a, the wild card came in the next year so um but you know that made me a better coach and it was hard. It was hard to survive that for a little while, just because of the feelings that came from that. You know, I, I can remember think after that game was over, there was no words you could say to those kids. Sure. Uh, because it would just nothing would ever make them feel better. And I even recognize, you know, that happened on like a Monday night because we used to play our district finals on about a, like a Monday night. Mm-hmm. And I can remember like the next day at school. Oh, finally on Wednesday, I, I told our principal. I said, I is like in the middle of the morning. I said. I need to call the basketball kids into the media center, and we need to talk. Yeah, uh, and that's what we did. So, we, like, they didn't go to class like third period, and we went in the media center and cried and talked and just aired and, out. Yeah, air, well, just for me to tell them how much yeah that like I cared about them and that this this one sixteen minutes didn't ruin your season or your identity mm-hmm. or or anything like that. Um, because they were champions. I mean, they just were fantastic basketball players that just unfortunately it just didn't work out. And you, and you look at it today, I mean, how many teams ever go undefeated anymore? Yeah. And we see it all the time. Great teams end up getting the state on a wild card yep. uh, because they just end up stubbing their toe, whether in a district final or in a sub-district or something. So that was a hard – that was hard. You it's know, hard it, it was really hard to hard to deal with. So When it's just hard to win yeah. at the end of the day. And especially in that conference too where you say – I mean, you're going against Dwayne Menlick. At CC, you're going against Pierce, you're going against Albion, you're going against Ponca, you know, with yeah, Bob Hayes. I, like, yeah, I'll, yeah. Just... Bob Hayes at Ponca. Uh, you had uh, Mike uh, uh, Emery over at Pierce. You had Chuck Perrone over yeah. at uh, Albion Boone Central. Uh, Lyle Nannan at Randolph was mm-hmm. an outstanding basketball coach. I mean, there was just so many things that uh, people were so good. I mean, yeah. it was so tough, so... And by the way, Laurel went through the state tournament after they beat us. They did not have a game within 15 points at state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of ran through everybody. Yeah, they did. They buzzed saw through it. We're, we're going to get back to basketball here in a second. What classes were you teaching at Cedar? And what was it like kind of being in that Catholic school setting again? Yeah, so I, was, uh, I taught American history, uh, but I also taught government. Um, and I re- if I remember right, I was doing some psych and soch as well too. But kind of a – you know, smaller schools, so you're going to do – you're going to have about five preps, sure. uh, somewhere like that. And so uh, that's what I was doing there. And what was it like kind of being back in that Catholic school setting again? Oh, it was, it was – well, that was, a, that was a new experience for me because I hadn't taught. Sure. And so that was a huge eye-opening experience for me as well, too. See, it was – you know, being at Cedar Harding is such a great place, great community – during that time that I was there also, I mean, we had, we had some tough things happen. 
in seven years that I was there, we had like seven students or parents die during that time. Oh man. And, and so those were, those are difficult things to deal with. Um, I was just really blessed that to be a part of a Catholic community, uh, that could do that. You know, I can remember getting a call was on the crisis team for the school and had to run up to Yankton. One of our students had been in a car accident and our students, some of our students had heard about that and they were very emotional in the waiting room and needed, you know, comfort and, and had to go up there and, and, uh, and kind of deal with that situation, which was a very difficult situation as well, too. And so, you know, God gives us uh, moments to, to try to have an impact, but he, but he also, you know, he doesn't give us anything that we're not equipped to handle. Yeah. Um, you know, as a person in dealing with those things, you got to grow up. I mean, you, you have, and, and I'm talking about me, myself, like I had to grow up, I had to be, make sure that they handle this with grace and, uh, you know, really be somebody that they, a trusted adult for yeah. them. Um, and so, uh, those were, those were tough things, uh, to, uh, endure. And I think, you know, our family, our kids had great friends in Hardington. My wife and I, we had good, good friends and and so we had really a great support system to work with there a great Catholic community. We found roots of putting our kids, you know, in the Holy Trinity elementary grade school where they had great teachers and we went to Holy Trinity church there. Um, and so you really just started to put your roots down and grow in your faith when you're part of a, a community like that. So you went to Holy Trinity. Mm-hmm. I know up there, obviously there's tons of beautiful Catholic churches in Bow oh, yeah, Valley, yeah. Fordyce and all those places. Like, God's country. It had been pretty cool to yeah. be able to like, you know, you go to Holy Trinity, but Hey, we're going to go to mass over here. Like, that had been pretty pretty neat to be able to experience that and see the people in your community, but in those different environments. Oh, it, definitely, because the the kids that were coming to Cedar were coming from fifteen twenty miles away. Sometimes, sure, uh, they could come from as far away as why not? Uh, they would come from Menominee and Bow Valley and Fordyce and and up on Highway eighty one near the Crofton area. They would come, um, and so it was really a wide range of of area that we were covering that those kids would come from. Um, even to the south down in Coleridge and, and places like that. So, yeah, there was, you know, you didn't have to go very go very far to find a Catholic church. What games stand out to you that you coached in at Cedar? I know you mentioned that one at Laurel, but maybe what's a, what's a few other ones that really stand out? There was one game that was, like, totally, like, you would say, this is a game that you remember. Um, we played in the Wayne State Holiday Tournament, and it was like there was it was always a three-day event. And we got to play Mount Michael. And I thought that was like a really big deal. Sure. Growing up in the Wahoo area. Yeah. Because K- Coach, Kane. Coach Kane was coaching Mount Michael as one of his last few years. And I can remember before the game, here I am, this young guy who's like in his early 30s coaching. And Coach Kane comes and sits by me in the bleachers and talks to me like I'm another coach. And I'm just like totally in awe. Because I played against him when I was in Wahoo. Sure. And, you know, killer cane, like his face would get red. He'd stop his feet. You know, he's wearing a suit and tie. But I just remember that game and that we, we won the game. And, but it was just like I was in awe of the fact that we were playing Mount Michael. It was just kind of like a surreal experience for me. So, for sure. Yeah. That's awesome. Who is the hardest to prep against? Pierce, without a doubt. They would, they would, do, they would take away your strengths every time. If you were somebody who liked to screen away, they would switch the screens every time and they'd be waiting. I mean, we would have to change. And this this still happened when I came to SCOTUS. We had to change our out-of-bounds plays every time we played Pierce wow. because their kids, if we said Georgetown, they would start to point and, and yell in the direction that we were going to go. They're running Georgetown. And it's like, wow. I mean, mm-hmm. I wish that I had the level of, of dedication and time that, <laughs> and preparation that Mike Emery did at Pierce. Um, yeah, I, I don't think there's any question that Pierce was at the, at the highest level of, of when, and that's a hard place to win. Like I can count on one hand how many times I've ever won there whether I was coaching at SCOTUS or at Cedar, it's a very hard place to win. Would you say that was probably the hardest place? I would say that Pierce was the hardest place to win, yeah. Or the old City Auditorium in Norfolk, where Norfolk Catholic used to play their games before they built their brand-new gym, but then that was a hard place to play, yeah. How many years did you spend at Cedar, and I guess what were 
some what were just some of your I know you kind of talked about just favorite memories in Hardington. Yeah, so uh, you know this uh we were there for 7 years and I think my just my favorite memories were the people that yeah. that I was associated with, uh the people that were my assistant coaches. They were like family to me. They're still friends. Uh we're still friends with them uh today and I just had the opportunity to be be around some great people. So what were your first impressions of SCOTUS growing up and then when you kind of became a teacher and a coach? So that that's a really good question. So when I had the opportunity to come to SCOTUS, you know, right away I gave – I held SCOTUS probably in the same regard that you would hold Pius in. SCOTUS was a very highly revered program. Jim and Gary Pitts, John Peterson, Jan Tooley, you know, all these names – of people that were doing work here, Merlin Lom, you know, things like that. And so SCOTUS was like, you know, a benchmark. I mean, it was it was a high benchmark. Uh, I knew that, you know, the basketball program wasn't maybe in great shape when we were when we were coming here, but SCOTUS was I, I just looked at it with extreme high high regard. So it was pretty much a no brainer, like when you knew oh this opportunity is there, like gonna and make the move. Yeah, well, so, you know, I think there's some other things that play into that. You know, our kids uh, are getting older, and we, we had just we just had our fifth one, Lindsay, who just now graduated from high school a year ago, but closer to Wahoo. My wife's family was from out by Funk, Nebraska, which is over by Holdridge. You know, it's a, it's a hard drive from Hardington for Christmases oh, and, for sure. and things like that. Um, so this put us a little more centrally located. Her father also at that time was uh, going through uh, uh, some cancer treatments, which which eventually, unfortunately, would take his life. At the, at, he died about the same time that we moved to Columbus. But it it just uh, seemed like it was it was a next step for us to take as a family. So, what are some of your first memories of moving to Columbus and and working here? Kind of you remember that first day, or what was? That oh, I can. Like? I, the thing that I would remember immediately is uh, when I got here. It was really early on, in like some of the first days I was here, I heard this roar, this constant talk chatter coming from people. I thought, "What is that?" So I follow the follow the voices, and I go to the gym, and it's the girls' volleyball team practicing. And I'd never witnessed that type of level of communication happening in anything else I'd ever done before. There was a constant, I got it, I got it, you got it, you go here, what, you know, just constant. And that's what made, to me, that's, that's what made them good. Yeah. They learned to trust each other. They communicated with each other. And they just were always on the same page. And I was like, oh, that's so awesome. The other thing that I noticed as I got here, too, is and I had high expectations for myself as a teacher, but when I got here, and you're around some of the people that we had that were teaching here, you you're like, I got up my game. Sure, like I cannot let I I am not going to be a person who's going to let you know let this down. Mm-hmm. There's a high level of education that's going on here. There's a there's a high level of commitment and engagement by the people that are working here. They have a unbelievable sense of pride in what they do i've got to meet that i've got to i've got to make sure that my my skill set meets that sure and that's great because the high expectations i mean they still live on today and it's something that when people ask me you know what do you like about working here at scotus and it's always just everybody's on the same page and we have high expectations and we you know we expect that from not only teachers employees but also students too and that's that's something that they're just going to help when they get out of this place. We have to have that. Yeah. If we ever, you know, um, in and you know, we're we're starting to lose some of that old guard of people who taught here, and and that was it was just woven in their DNA of those high expectations, and that's why it's so important the people that come in that that end up taking those positions that they they have that as well too that they have that epiphany moment like I had when I got here of. Wow, this is a special place, and I need to work my tail off to make sure that we have those that those high expectations continue. We have to do that. Otherwise, I mean, what are we doing? I mean, we we can't just uh, you know just you know go down to average or or just uh, accept 
things that are not great. Sure. I'm not saying that we're going to be perfect and we're going to do things great all the time and we're going to make mistakes, but let's try. Yeah. Let's give it our best effort. And try not to be complacent. Yeah, and there, but there's also an awakening of your own self when you do that, that you recognize that you can get more out of yourself when you do that. You recognize that you have more in you to give than maybe you ever thought that you had to give and that people are getting the best version of you. And that's what that's what we want for people who work here, who teach here, uh, for our students. Let's let's work toward that best version of ourselves. Yeah, and as somebody who has lived in it for the last five years, I can definitely speak for that because first eight years professionally, it kind of just felt like I was floating around. And then I come here and I can see everybody has these expectations. And I've seen more in myself personally just by being being here and being involved with those people. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. How did the kids adapt to the move? Because obviously you had kind of a wide ranging of ages. Hard move. Yeah. Hard move. Katie, our oldest, was going to be a seventh grader, so just going junior high. Maybe a little bit easier for her because everybody's new here. Yeah. Ryan, tough move. Sixth grade, tough move. Sure. Lifelong friends pretty much had grown up in, in Hardington for the K through six part of it, so tough move. Tough move for Kristen, our, our third one, and Megan, our our fourth one. You know, the, all those things, were there were tough moves for them. Um, you know, eventually it, it gets better, but I would say that I probably underestimated that, you know, how, yeah. how hard that move would be for our kids. So, and then how do you, you know, kind of adapt to that as a parent, obviously you're starting a new job and like, it's, it's affecting you too. And then, you know, obviously your kids are the number one, but how do you kind of try to help with that at home? Well, you, you just try to do the best that you can in, in terms of giving, giving them your time. But you also have to have the patience to understand that time is the only thing that can heal that. Yeah. And that new friendships will develop. Kids are resilient. Mm -hmm. They will still go. There will be that level of anxiety about some things that because they're out of their comfort zone. So speaking of Ryan, what was it like coaching him in basketball? And how <laughs> how fun was that? How maybe not fun some days were? Or we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, it's a... It, it is a blessing, but it's also hard, you know. So if I'm demanding a lot, I'm probably going to demand more from my son. And uh, so whether or not, you know, that was a good experience or not for, for him, you know, I, I sure hope it was. But I also understand that, you know, playing for your dad is a tough thing. It, and it puts you in a tough position when you're playing for your dad. Um, if uh, other players maybe don't always agree with the coach or whatever and, and uh, they had the kids have to deal with that. You know, there were there were definitely some great moments there as well too, and some very rewarding things. But no doubt, it's a it's a it can be a tough thing. Yeah, when he was kind of part of that those early years for you when this helped start build it up. So you know, yeah. hopefully he can kind of appreciate like he was well, we, that, we, that group when yeah. they were kind of seniors. We're kind of we're building the foundation here for the next. Yeah, we we talk a lot about like the game. I think he was a junior in high school and. We upset Hastings State Cecilia in the first game of the year, and I think they were they might have been rated number one. It was a great game. We played with a lot of grit in that game and ended up winning it. I can remember the seeing the pride on his face when he won when they, we won that game and how happy he was. And you know it was just an exciting time for all of us. So yeah. So if you were building a basketball team from scratch, what position do you start with? Well, I think you need to you really need a good point guard. When I was coach, I think of like one especially. Uh, you needed like a Jared Ostick or a Nathan uh, Nate Ostick. Well, I had Jared first of all, his older brother, mm -hmm. uh, when we when I first started coaching here, and then like Nathan Ostick later on. Um, you need uh, leadership at the point guard position. You need somebody who's unselfish and knows how to get people shots, and doesn't have to necessarily be a scorer, but understands how to play the game and where the ball needs to go. That's that's definitely where I would start. So you had a great coaching career and took the Shamrocks to the state tournament three straight years. Uh, kind of what was that experience like, kind of building it up and then taking it to that level and then getting to state for the first time and having, you know, SCOTUS on your polo? The building up of the program was probably the most, most fun. Yeah. The last three years that I did it were very rewarding, and we, we got a lot of accolades and a lot of notoriety. But let me tell you, when, when I did take it over, there were some tough times. We lost our first six games in a row. We played a brutal schedule. We were sitting up in Wayne in a band room is what they put us in, and we sat there after that game was over after another tough loss. We played really well. We were close, 
but we lost. And so we're going into Christmas and we're sitting at 0 and 6. And everybody just sat there staring at the wall and tears. And the, I remember that moment like it was yesterday. It's just burned into my brain. And then, then those guys started to win some games. And then they won nine of them in January and February. And so we were able to equal that output for those first five years, which was pretty cool yeah. to do. And then, and then the next year I think we won uh, like 12 or 13. And that next year we beat GICC at GICC in the conference tournament. We won a road game the night before, and we went and beat GICC. That was unbelievably huge sure. to do that. For our program to beat Grand Island Catholic was – was just a monster win for us to to be able to do that. There were great memories all the way, you know, through what we did. Um, I think about Derek Lom and Brennan Brockhouse when those guys were seniors, and uh, we kind of took over and we kind of really started to push the ball, and we beat Hastings St. Cecilia by a lot the first game of the year. And I remember looking at those guys on the bench during the fourth quarter. I took them out. We were up by 25 or so. I said, look at that scoreboard. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever think in, a, in any point in your life that you, that would be the score you'd be playing St. Cecilia? And and they just had a, a great season. We were in a sub-district with Wallow High and Newman. <laughs> it, it was here in Columbus. But uh, you know, we gave Wallow High a really good game for about three quarters. Uh, that that night but uh, but that the foundation had been set um, we continually got better and better every year we started making it to the final four of the conference tournament you know we did that probably I don't know four or five times eventually won one beat St. Cecilia in, in overtime and St. Saint Saint Centennial Conference again no joke like mid-state conference during the time when you were at Hardington Centennial maybe was a little bit down but then when you get here Centennial was really cooking oh, during that man. time I mean everybody was yeah. good yep. everybody was you get good. to the eight nine team and you're like oh man we got to play them <laughs> I can't even think of a team that yeah that was not good and just some of the coaches uh, so. you had to go against too oh yeah I mean it was just incredible so very blessed. I mean, in the end, you know, like just to sum it up about Scotus basketball, I'm really, I'm really proud of it. But man, it took a lot of work from a lot of people. Mike Van Cannon, uh, it was instrumental in the success that we had, uh, helping out our young kids. You know, when he started working with, well, I'm working with high school kids, and then he's investing his time into into younger kids. Um, all that culminated in that night over at Concordia, uh, at Concordia University when we beat uh, Milford to go to state that first time it's like wow we did it you know and we were lucky enough that we won kind of handily and so could really kind of savor and enjoy the last three or four minutes of that game because it was just like this is incredible yeah you know so yeah that's awesome in the fall of 2016 you embark on in your journey as president of SCOTUS what made you decide to take that leap well I had always envisioned that uh, this is eventually where I would go toward educational administration. I kind of felt like it's very similar to being a, a coach in just a different way of being an instructional leader of a school, um, also of being somebody who could who could develop a strategic plan, a, a vision, a mission for for where we want to go as a school. That I thought that it was time to take that next step in my career. That it was time to, to do that, and it was something, it was a challenge that I felt like the Lord was leading me to, that that it was the next step for me. So, How instrumental was Wayne Morfeld to you? Yeah, so Wayne was a great mentor to me. He was great when, when I got here uh, just as a teacher for me. Um, having him as the instructional leader was great, um, and then just the, the mentorship that he provided as I transition into his position you know I'll forever be grateful for all the help that he gave me he was a, a very cool-headed man uh in his leadership um he just was you know he was so dedicated to everything that was all scotus um i just greatly appreciate the friendship that he gave me you brought in uh the faith service gratitude motto what does that mean to you and how do you think our students live out those words every day yeah so you know the we have to provide an opportunity for our students here to grow in their faith. 
and really for our faculty as well too the, the people who work here it has to be it it can never be just a you know status quo thing it has to be an evolving thing where we are moving in a direction where we are growing closer to God and you do that by just also a recognition of gratitude for thankfulness for all the good things in your life of taking stock of all the good things in your life being being really in tune with that when you do that you have a much more positive attitude about where you're going where your things are headed where you're going you're you have gratitude and, and you're thankful and then you what you're doing is in service of people christ asks us to be in service to people to to help others to be uh, my brother's keeper to help others. It's easy. For, it should be easy for us to recognize people who need help. It can be emotional, just kind of helping them talk through some things, providing friendship to them, showing them mercy. You know, and understanding that uh, everybody's going through something at some point in their life. And um, when you have a family. Like if we're going to call ourselves a, a family, a family of teachers or a, a family um, at SCOTUS or within our Columbus Catholic schools, then you're there for each other. You're in, you're in service to each other. Under your watch in your first year, you suggested the idea of bringing a STEAM lab to SCOTUS. Seeing that idea come to life and thrive in pretty much every class period of the day, what does that mean to you? Yeah, so everything that that has happened here are not my original ideas. I just want to make that clear. Okay. God led me, yeah. the Holy Spirit led me to whatever, some recognition that that was something that needed to happen. So I was uh, doing a teacher observation. I was sitting in the back of the room, and I noticed a student who was just, you could tell they were bored. This is a very, very bright student who got the work done, knew how to do it, maybe knew how to do it as well as the teacher knew how to do it. They needed more. They needed more that would challenge them with their with their mind, but also the ability of putting things together, doing it physically, you know, with your hands. Um, and so that's where it was born from. Also taking some trips and looking at what some other schools were doing in this area. And then God put on my heart to, we had kind of started to know Betsy Rawl a little bit through some of the things we were doing. And I brought her into my office one day, and we were just talking about things. And I remember just sitting across the table from her. I looked at her and said, do you want to work here? We can make this STEAM lab kind of what you want it to be, where, where you think it should go. We'll create the resources for you. We had a successful fundraising event. And that's where it's born from. So, I mean, yeah, God led me to it, but Betsy's been the driving force of all of that. Yeah. I mean, Betsy deserves all of the credit, anything that has been good that's come from the STEAM Lab is Mrs. Rawl. And that's one of the, my favorite places to take visitors when they come is obviously we take them up there and they get to see the kids in action and see them doing these things. And everybody walks away and they're like, that is really neat that that's offered throughout the day. Because everyday people who aren't in a school, they just kind of think of what it was like when they were in school. Yeah, And to see those things happening up there with the – um, electronics and the 3D printers and all those things like the Carvey, like it's awesome. It's really, really a great thing for our kids to have that opportunity. My favorite thing to say is that on this day, at this time in history, a SCOTUS student has, has more opportunities than any other SCOTUS student who's ever come before them by the things that we're being able to do in the school, whether it be from health occupation, the health science things, to the STEAM to the college credit classes that we now have, you know, all those things. Um, you know, that's, it's just, uh, I, I love it. So you, you've been involved with four SEF fund drives since being in your administrative position. How important is that? And explain why it's unique. Well, it's, it's such a big part of our budget. I mean, the SEF is going to put about $350,000 or so into our general budget every year. You know, SCOTUS has, you know, roughly probably about a $3.9 million budget. And, you know, our tuition is going to cover, we hope, close to 40% of that. The rest of it we lean on development and fundraising and then the 25% that our parish can can offer to us to, to help. I mean, the cost of educate is around $10,000 a student. So this fundraising that we do 
is of the utmost importance. It is, I mean, without it, we're not able to do the things that we can do for our students. We don't charge any other fees or, you know, those kind of things. And yes, I know there are other fundraising things that we do, but to keep our tuition affordable for our families, we really, we want to be able to do that. But we also want to have, we don't want to be a minor league education. We want to be a major league education. We want to have great opportunities for our kids that are going to set them up for success in the future. That's from the development of their faith life to the development of, you know, the, the, the mind, body, soul. We want to educate all three of those things. So that fundraising piece is, is huge. And what's, what's very awe-inspiring to me and it's very humbling is the people that have sent their kids to school here. They don't have any, they don't have the tuition anymore. They could just say, "Hey, I did my part." There are so many people from around this country in all fifty states that send money to SCOTUS to help fund this school, and that's because they got something out of it. The investment that this place made in them that they're now, they're now willing that it it created such a positive for them in their life and provide them opportunity they're willing now to go back and invest in that so that other kids can have that opportunity. Yeah, and it's great to, to see that, especially those parents who may not have kids here anymore or who have moved away. They're still supporting this place because it, it mattered to them, it mattered to their kids, and at the end of the day, that support's just going to help keep this place going with and having us letting us be able to have some of these major league education opportunities. Yeah. I mean, isn't that a beautiful thing that other people want other kids, yeah. uh, someone else's kids to have a great opportunity? That's a beautiful thing it when is. that happens. If you were speaking to a college student studying to be an educator, what would you tell them about CCS and why this is a great place to work? Obviously, there's you know the, the teaching shortage, all these things, but this is a special place. So, uh, yeah, I would tell them, first of all, that uh, they went, they chose education because it meant something to them that they want to be a teacher. And that here they're going to get to teach. They're going to, you know, our classroom management is not, you know, uh, it's manageable. And uh, our students want to learn. They want to succeed. You're going to be surrounded by a staff that's going to help you grow as a teacher, um, provide you with professional development, faith development, those kind of things. We will do whatever we can to try to make it a successful opportunity to you. And I try, I, I mean, I'm being sincere when I tell them that. And I hope that they can read that, that are being sincere, that we will, you know, we're not going to put a bunch of their red tape and things that, and complicate things. We want you to do what you do well, and that's teach. And we're going to provide you with the tools with it, but God's given you an ability, and we want to help mold that and grow that within our system. What's it been like working alongside Deb? You know, I really don't see her that, sure. that often. With the uh, third floor? Yeah. You know, she's up on the third floor, but it's a blessing also to have that opportunity to, to work with, uh, you know, the person who's special in your life. She's, she's a really good teacher. You know, our, our seventh graders are really blessed to, to have that opportunity. I kind of refer to her as kind of the mother, mother hen of uh, the mother of the seventh grade kids when they come in. Uh, she really kind of teaches them a SCOTUS way of doing things, getting them organized and that. And so uh, I'm just I'm just grateful that she's part of our staff. Yeah, she does a great job. I mean, I've worked with her on a couple of different things when it comes to orientation days and stuff. And it is hard for those seventh graders because it is so new and it's a new building. And you meet you meet kids who are in your grade, but you've never maybe even met them before. Now there's a little more collaboration. So that happens more where they get to meet each other. But still, it's it's a change. And she just does a really good job of keeping everybody in check yep you know, right. if you're a minute late to class the first week you're okay like yeah and I, I i think we have great uh junior high teachers i think they oh, all yeah they all uh meet the kids where they're at yep. so i think that's awesome what would you say to a young family in columbus who may not have gone to scotus or you know their parents didn't go to scotus or they moved here um, what would you say like why ccs i mean for somebody like me it was easy for us to make this decision i i went to public school but then coached at North Platte St. Patrick's for two years and being in that environment, I knew like if I can, if I have the ability to send my kids to Catholic school, I want to be able to do that. Yeah. I, first of all, they're good, just going to get a great education because we have great teachers. We have experienced teachers that are going to do a great job. It's faith of values. Yeah. It's the faith. It's, it's being taught the Catholic faith, the Christian faith. 
but also the values that we try to instill in our kids for whether it's uh, being, you know, resilient, grit, collaborate with each other, be a problem solver. Um, you know, all those things we want to be intentional about teaching our kids values as well. Not that we're going to be the, the, you know, parents are the, are the primary teachers of that, the faith and the value system that everybody has, but we're going to, we're going to help, um, mold that and shape that as well too. Um, and provide that uh, for our families. We really want our families to be able to grow together and learn together, um, grow in their faith together, engage with each other, um, because raising kids is hard. And a support system that we can put in place to help with that is it's really important. If you had to describe Columbus Catholic Schools in one word, what would it be? Hmm. I, I think it would be excellence. And it's because everywhere I go, I see excellence. I mean, congratulations to St. Isidore School. They, they, you know, they have an opportunity to possibly be a blue ribbon school for their reading scores. I look at the great things that happen over at St. Anthony's on a daily basis. Same thing at St. Bonaventure School. Great things. And over here, at, in at Scoto Central Catholic as well too. There's just there's excellence everywhere. It's really easy to take it for granted sometimes, but I'm telling you, the people who are here in our schools that are working for the children that the parents have entrusted with us are high quality people. They are top notch people who are professionals at what they do, and they strive for excellence. Well, I think that'll wrap it up for our very first episode. Thank you, Mr. O, for taking the time and sharing your stories with Shamrock Nation and all of our CCS families and supporters. Yeah, you're welcome, Taylor. If you're interested in hearing more Shamrock Green Room episodes, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Make sure to follow us on our social media channels. Go to Central Catholic on Facebook, X, and YouTube, and Columbus Catholic Schools on Instagram. Thanks again for joining us in the Shamrock Green Room.